Holly was 12 years old when she came to Presbyterian Children's Village where I was working as chaplain and counselor. Holly had bombed out of foster care based on her behavior. And now she was with us in residential treatment. Her mom was a schizophrenic bag lady on the streets of Philadelphia. Her father had abandoned the family many years before. Holly was very, very bright, very angry, very obnoxious, and very sarcastic. It was a lethal combination if you wanted to have peers for friends and have adults care about you. Almost everybody didn't like Holly. In fact, most disliked her intensely. But I have to say that I liked her from the start. Maybe it was because people of my personality type actually enjoy sarcasm. <laughs> but unlike Holly, I had learned that most people don't and some are even hurt by it, so sarcastic Mark has been locked in the attic for the last 40 years most of the time. You laugh, but I can tell you it's pretty hard sometimes. In my office at the Samaritan Center, I had a picture, and the picture was me playing basketball in high school, and I was scoring a breakaway layup, and the other guy in the picture was, had thrown the bad pass, and he was watching me score. And when people would see the picture, they would ask me, is that you? And that's not such a bad question. I, I didn't have a hard time controlling myself, though I don't know why I'd have a picture of Quincy scoring a basket on my wall. <laughs> But the, invariably, the second question was, which one were you? Now, seriously, people, <laughs> why would I put a picture of myself watching somebody else score a basket? Uh, so, but I would keep it to myself. I was able to keep sarcastic Mark in the attic. But maybe it was that ability that enabled me to see beyond the anger and beyond the obnoxiousness and sarcasm to see a, a girl with lots and lots of hurt and a girl with lots and lots of potential. For the last several summers, I've been part of a contemplative prayer group here at Westminster. And this summer, we focus on the promises of God. And the scripture is full of God's promises. But I became convinced that the, there are two promises that are most important, the promise that each of us is a beloved child of God, and the promise that God makes that I will be with you, that God promises the journey with us throughout the course of our life. These, I think, are the two foundational promises of a life of faith. We are each a beloved child of God, and God is journeying with us throughout the course of our life. Quincy's sermon last week was about baptism, the meaning of baptism. He shared more with us at Madeline's baptism this morning. And I really believe that when we baptize a child, it's shaped by these foundational promises that we as God's representative are acknowledging that this is a child, a beloved child of God, and that God is committed to journeying with Madeline throughout the course of her life. And we make promises too. We make promises that we're going to help to nurture that relationship and to remind all our members that we are beloved children of God and that God is with us always. Dick Rogers used to like to mention from time to time on a passage from the Old Testament that says that, that on the day each of us was born, the angels in heaven sing a unique song. I always love that thought that with each birth, with each birth of a new member of the family of God, the angels are singing a unique song of, of celebration for that life. And I like to think that the angels are not only singing in celebration of the birth of a new child of God, but that they're also singing in anticipation of the promise of that child, 
the promise of what that child can become, who that child can become, and what impact that they have the potential of making on our world. I met with Holly one afternoon after she had had a verbal altercation with her teacher. And after I let her vent a little bit and explain her side of the story, I asked her, how could you have handled that differently? And she responded, I should have taped her to the ceiling. <laughs> now this wasn't really the response that I was looking for. So after we talked a while longer, I tried again the second time. How could you have handled it differently? And she said, I should have thrown her out the window. By now, it seemed to me that this session wasn't going very well. And I had to say to her, you know, if you threw her out the window, I'd have to visit you in jail. And she said, uh, well, it probably has better food than Presbyterian Children's Village. And she might have been right about that. Our time has come to an end, so I tried a third time. How could you have handled that differently? And she said, I should have smeared her head with jelly and painted her in an anthill. And I think, oh, great. I, I, I know the only 12-year-old Philadelphia kid who knows Pancho Villa. Well, that session didn't seem to do much, and we, we left, and we were walking towards our unit when we ran into our teacher, who was a sunbeam type of person, and she greeted Holly warmly despite their allocation. Hi, Holly. And Holly started to say something, and then she closed her mouth, and she walked away. And I could see the hurt in the teacher's face, and I was embarrassed at how Holly had treated her. And I had to think that if the angels were still singing for Holly or about Holly, it must have been a really sad song. <whistles> Jesus' parable of the sower is one of the most familiar stories to mo many of us. And when we think about it, the sower goes out and he throws seed and some of it lands on fertile soil and some lands on the pathway and some on rocky soil. And if we stop to think about it, we might think that they weren't such good farmers just throwing seeds everywhere. I mean, we know that you dig a hole, you put a seed in and you cover it up. But in their world, they did it the opposite way. They threw the seeds out and then they turned the soil over. And they weren't, and they threw it everywhere on every piece of land, no matter how rocky it was, not because they were dumb, but because so land was precious and crop was precious, and it was worth it to throw it on the rocky soil, even though it was unlikely that it would grow there. And so they threw with the hopes that. Maybe it would be like that lone tree you sometimes see that somehow is growing outside of a mountain. And you wonder, how, how did that tree thrive going through all that rocky, rocky soil? Now, most of the time when we hear the parable of the sower, I bet we do a little soul searching, a little self-examination. What type of soil am I? Where is my spiritual life right now? And if, if we're in need of some soul searching, that's the right message to hear from this parable. But in the Gospel of Mark, there's an even stronger message. It isn't calling us as much to look at ourselves and what type of soil we are as much as a call for sowers. In Jesus' day and in this day, the kingdom had a desperate need for sowers. And so Jesus' hope was that we would hear the parable and hear the call to become sowers of the Word of God. And so ironically, a parable that most of the time has us looking inward actually sometimes is asking us to stop doing what we used to call navel-gazing and lift our heads upward toward God and outward toward one another. In the movie, Oh God, the John Denver character wasn't sure whether his spreading the message of God made a difference or whether it was worthwhile. And God responds, do we have enough apples? And you see John Dever shake his hair and go, apples? And then God says, we have plenty of apples because of Johnny Appleseed and all the seeds that he planted. 
And today we still have plenty of apples because people continue to plant seeds and to nurture them. And today we still have plenty of people of faith because someone's planted a seed and nurtured that seed within us. If each of us was to tell our faith story, I would doubt that there would be anyone whose faith story didn't include some very important people who planted seeds within us and who nurtured those seeds. Well, clearly, Holly was the, ro the rockiest of all soil. It was hard to see if anything would grow within her angry and hurt person. And she was so challenging to work with that I often enlisted the help of the only other staff person that liked her. And together, we persevered and tried our best to help her. And one time in this particular session, Holly kept running out, and the staff person kept bringing her back. And after the fourth time that the staff person brought her back, Holly sat down and she said to me, I hate you, I've always hated you, and I always will hate you. Well, that was kind of the end of that session. <laughs> and since I was, it was the last thing that I did that day, I was walking home, and as I was walking home, I remembered that when I was a kid, I wanted to be a mailman. We had a really neat mailman in our neighborhood who walked around with his beautiful uh, Irish setter and stopped to play basketball with us sometimes. And I kind of thought, you know, walking around on a nice day with my dog and playing basketball with kids sounded like a really nice job to have. And I got to tell you that day, I really wish I was a mailman. It seemed uh, that that would be a little more uh, fun and rewarding than trying to work with Holly. And it seemed so un un unlikely that she was going to be that tenacious tree that was going to thrive in the rockiest of soil. We continued to work with her and do our best, but she went downhill over the next few weeks. And while I was away for a couple of days, she made a serious suicide attempt and was hospitalized. And that was the last time that I ever saw her. We had tried our best, but it was an incredibly bitter failure. Not only because we weren't successful, but because I could see how badly that hurting person needed to heal, and I could see the potential of what she could be if that hurt was ever healed. Our contemplative prayer group this summer began with the story of Moses and the burning bush. Moses is working as a shepherd and he sees a bush burning but not being consumed. And so he goes to look at it closely and God speaks to him through the burning bush. And it's one of those times in scripture that God issues the promise, I will be with you. And a few weeks later, we ended our prayer group with the passage from Matthew, Jesus, where the disciples have gathered on the mountain and they see the resurrected Jesus for the very last time. And the Gospel of Matthew closes with the words, remember, I will be with you always to the end of the age. And I have to say over these last 40 years, over these last 40 years, there's probably been no passage in scripture that's been more comforting than the thought that God has been with me to the end of the age. Now you may have noticed that there's another common theme between Moses and the disciples. And that, that common theme is that the promise that God will be with us also comes with a call. Moses is called to lead the Exodus and to lead the people of Israel to freedom. The disciples are called to make disciples of all nations and to baptize everyone in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Promise and call somehow are inextricably intertwined. Moses and the disciples answered the call and they sowed seeds they sowed powerful seeds, 
powerful seeds that 3,000 years later and 2,000 years later are still bearing fruit. Now Moses died before seeing the promised land. John Denver in the movie doesn't get to see whether his work pays dividends. Many of the disciples were martyred before they saw the seeds they planted growing in in the Christian church. And yet answering the call gave profound meaning to their lives. Whether they entered the promised land or not, it turned out to be profoundly worthwhile to answer the call and to sow seeds. Now I think you and I often underestimate the power of story and that in particular we underestimate the power of our own story. One of the things we ask our trainees to do is to, to do a detailed history of their own family. And it's somewhat astounding to find out that most people know hardly anything about their own family. And even when we send them back to talk to parents and grandparents, they still come back with a minimum of knowledge of the story of their family. And so somehow, somehow we've decided that our family story isn't worth telling. And our family story isn't something that we want to pass from generation to generation. And if we ask, the, ask our trainees to go back and talk about the spiritual story of their family, it's often the same thing. They know very little about the spiritual family of their story of their, story of their family. There's probably lots of reasons for this, but I wonder if one reason is that oftentimes we see ourselves as ordinary people or living ordinary lives. We're ordinary people living ordinary lives. What is the value in the story that we have to tell? Do we have a story to tell? And in those moments when we see ourselves as ordinary and our lives as ordinary, somehow we've lost touch with the promises of God that we are a unique and special child of his and that he is with us always to the end of the age. The last couple years I've attended an awful lot of funerals and actually done a a number of funerals. I guess I'm at that stage of life where loss becomes an increasing reality and our church is at the point in their development where We've lost a lot of long time and, and wonderful members. And there's a couple of things that struck me about in attending those funerals is number one, everyone that I've attended has had a story to tell, a story that I didn't know. And I realized how incredibly little I knew about people, even people I'd known for years. And the, thing that, the second thing that, test, that touched me is how many people testified to the impact that this ordinary person made on their lives. I bet you most of the folks would have been really surprised to hear how profound an impact their seemingly ordinary life made on the people they loved and who loved them. All these folks clearly sowed seeds in the lives of so many people. Last April, my best friend uh, died in an accident. We have been friends since the late 1960s. So we've been friends for over 45 years. And his memorial service was really something amazing. When it came time for people to spontaneously talk about him, an unbelievable number of folks got up to share how he had touched their lives. Many of the people that that spoke had known him five or six years longer than I had, so they had had 50 years of friendship. And the common theme was that, that Ned had been the individual who had really ensured that those relationships lasted year after year. For the past many years, he had come out to visit Suzanne and I every July. 
Ned would have been stunned to hear the impact that he had made on so many lives because he saw himself as an ordinary person living an ordinary life. But we were there in testimony on how powerful the seeds were that he planted in each of our lives and how much he had touched us. Each of us here is a beloved child of God with unique gifts and a unique story and unique opportunities to touch the lives of those around us. I've been, I've been out here at the Samaritan Center in Northwest Indiana for several years. When I came into work a couple days after Christmas, I remember being by myself here in the church and coming down and, and getting the mail out of the Samaritan Center mailbox. And there was this letter that was addressed to Mark Kilmer in Munster, Illinois, with a, some bizarre zip code. And somehow it still had been delivered. It looked like the mailman had kind of stepped on it. It had a rough road to, to get to me. and probably was a miracle it got there at all. And I thought if I was a mailman, I would have treated it a lot nicer. <laughs> but I wonder, who, who's, this, who's writing me in Munster, Illinois? And I opened up the letter, and the, the letter was from Holly. It was over a decade later. And she said that she felt the need to write uh, to thank me for caring about her and to, uh, to say that she realized now uh, how much we were trying to help, in her words, the troubled girl who was she. And as a minister of God, she said she wanted me to know that she was now a card-carrying member of the Christian church. In parentheses, she put that she was a liberal Christian, though. I don't know what she thought I was. Uh, and that she was also saved, and maybe that meant an extra measure of grace. And she went on to tell me that she was working full-time, she was in college full-time, and that she had reconciled with her father. And she included a picture of her and her boyfriend. Well, um, we don't get letters like that many days, many days, and it's, it's nice to be thanked. But the reality is that um, she tested the limits of my expertise, and it wasn't really so much my work that helped her. But somewhere in the midst of our time together, Seeds were planted in the rockiest of soil. Seeds that would be nurtured by her and others and that would take a full decade, a full decade to blossom and to grow. And the seeds grew because they were good seeds, the very best. I had to think at that point that the angels were now singing a song of celebration of the person that Holly had become. And I can only imagine in the years after the impact that this Holly and her story made in the lives of others. On the day we were born, the angels sing a unique song just for us in celebration of a new member of the family of God and in anticipation for the person that each of us will become, and in anticipation for the impact that, with God's help, we'll make in the lives of those we encounter. And so today, I hope that you'll recognize that you have a unique story to share, and that you will begin to share it to the people in whom you encounter. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.